I'm going to turn off the ding dong if yes, I can. Okay. I thought it was off, but I'm going to try to do that now. Thank you very much. Let me go and share screen. Is everyone seeing my main screen? Yes. Okay, great. Do. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our afternoon uh, for ratification forum, uh, where we're going to focus particularly on changes that were made, it, made to the uh, uh, four part-timers relative to the new contract. Last week, I sent out a full um, uh, synopsis of all the contract changes. Um, so I will make sure that Michael, Michael Henderson, our executive director, for those of you who haven't met him yet, uh, Michael uh, will be putting, putting the, um, the document into the chat intermittently over uh, the next hour or so. Um, but thank you for being here. We really appreciate you taking time out of your afternoon. Um, and I'll stop intermittently to, to ask, answer any questions. And then also um, uh, members of our team who are here can also answer questions that you put into the chat. So we'd also appreciate it if you signed into the chat for us as well, so that we know who's present. Um, just a quick overview of the negotiation team. Um, we, uh, we had a total of 12 people on our team, but I really would like to, to take a moment to thank um, the folks who were on the part-time uh, small group team who did a lot of work to make sure that we uh, were able to make changes um, to uh, and improve um, what's available in the uh, what's available to part timers as well as the rights of part timers, and that's uh, you know, Lakeisha Beckham, uh, Linda Sneed, and Michael Henderson. Um, and then also we we brought in a number of folks who could also help. Um, and uh, also part of our team was Chris Bauer, although he worked on leaves, was also instrumental in the research of this group, as was Leon Smith. And so I really want to um, take a minute to thank all of them for their tremendous work on behalf of part timers and to make sure that um, we did as much as possible um, to uh, to make changes that for many of us we've wanted for quite a while. So let me start with the money parts of, of, of our contract. As some of you may know, here in Los Rios, we use what's called a bucket system, which basically means that we're assured a particular proportion of the dollars that come in from the state. Um, so uh, basically with a cost of living increase, um, it gets split first into 80 and 20, 20% to the administration, 80% to all of the uh, bargaining units of which uh, the faculty are the largest unit. We, we get about 61 to 62% of that 80% side. Um, and it's also important to note that we negotiate our, um, our salary increases and changes to the salary schedule every summer, as well as what we call retroactive pay. Because we're guaranteed a certain amount of money, any money that goes unused gets redistributed on a pro rata basis to our faculty. And so you get that. So basically this summer, we will be negotiating the overall cost of living increase that would be going forward, um, starting in the 23, 24 year, as well as um, money that is owed to you or owed to the faculty that get distributed also in August. And we call that the retro. So one of the reasons why, one of the reasons I note this on the front end is that with most negotiations, um, people are like, well, where's the pay raises? Well, for us, it works just a little bit differently than other bargaining units and other uh, institutions. One thing that we did do, um, because when we restructured the salary schedule, it did favor those folks who were in steps one through 15. And one thing that the entire bargaining team thought was really important was that we needed to make sure that we improved the, the, the top 10 steps step 16 to 25 of the schedule. And so we added um, a, an additional $250 between steps 16 to 24 on the 164, and then it was prorated um, to all the other schedules. So this will increase the hourly wage a little bit um, on the uh, B schedules. And this, all of this is before the COLA. So I wanna go through some of the general sort of changes 
um, for poor talk faculty in terms of the contract. And then there's some that I've grouped by theme. So first, um, we sort of internally sort of joked that uh, the, the easiest thing to pass was going to be making sure that everyone had a parking pass. Um, before the language had just simply had said preference adjunct faculty, we got word of the word preference. Ironically, it actually took us a month to get this done. We have no idea why, but um, everyone will have parking passes now. Um, one of the really important um, changes, and this is something that we've we heard from our from our part time faculty who were already doing service and felt that this work really needed to be compensated. We are expand. We worked on the expansion of a paid college service and professional development opportunity for adjunct faculty. Uh, the pin, um, the payment will be uh, at each person's actual class and step instead of at class one step one on the B three schedule. So um, we're going to get you paid at your current rate. It currently includes serving as a senator, but will expand for other. Um, but will expand for other senate related work. And LRCFT and LRCCD are, are still working to develop a specific number of hours per semester per year um, and also create a comprehensive uh, list that includes equity trainings, departmental service, for example, department meetings, hiring committees, completions of tasks associated with performance review and more. Um, we were negotiating for about 10 weeks, so two and a half months, just under three months. So we we've decided that the part that we that the part that we agreed on was that yes, we will have paid service. Yes, we want it at a uh, step in class. And we knew that it was gonna take a while to get a comprehensive list. And so that list may also evolve over time. But this was, a, I think a really big win um, for, for the team that we were able to move forward on behalf of part-time faculty. We also got rid of finally after almost a decade, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe, uh, yeah, I guess we've had this for about a decade. We had a 0.6 level preference, um, which last time we had, last contract cycle, we had hoped to get rid of, but were unable to. Uh, but we finally got rid of the pilot language, making the 0.6 preference a permanent subcategory of the second level preference. Uh, preference adjunct faculty can also now provide feedback on the annual department chair feedback form. Um, and uh, actually, I'm going to pause right there. Are there any questions regarding any of the any of the topics that I've talked about so far? Because this next one actually is going to take some explanation. Are there any questions in the chat that I need to be aware of? Not yet, Belinda. I've just put a note in the chat saying if people have questions, they can type them in there, and I'll either answer them in the chat or pass them on to you for a verbal answer. Okay. So here's one that I think is an important change to to make sure I take a little time. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Linda. Oh, well, I was just going to clarify in case folks had missed this, that the expansion of the uh, compensation for college service and professional development is set to be launched in fall. We're going to be working over the summer to really pin down this expanded list and work, working with the district to do that. So that's something you can look forward to happening in the fall. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Belinda. <clears throat> okay, and so um, we are, um, one thing that's really important to note is that uh, now preference adjunct faculty who receive a written reprimand for substantiated misconduct as a result of a misconduct investigation will, lo uh, will lose their preference and be considered new adjunct faculty for the purposes of assignment. So this was, there are some, there are some types of discipline cases that um, uh, in the literal term is that are at the level of moral turpitude that can lead to immediate termination of any faculty member. Um, but there are things like discrimination or a, a number of other things that lead to investigation that do not lead to firing. Um, or um, And because uh, the, the way the adjunct contracts work is that on the one hand, you can be found guilty of discrimination, for example, um, but at the same time, there are rehire rights um, that mean that they actually have to be, that preference faculty member needs to be hired back the next semester. So essentially what this is saying is, is that um, if they're found, if an individual is found guilty, if you're a preference faculty and you're found guilty in a misconduct investigation, you could lose your preference. Now, what's important to note here is that um, this change, this change is attached to all of our due process rules and, and rules of representation. We also have, uh, uh, have the right to rescind this program at any point if we believe it's being abused by the administration as just a way to get rid of part-time faculty. And we have that written in on a year-to-year uh, year -year basis. 
And so um, this is this is a change, but at the same time, I would tell you that over the last three years, the college presidents have maybe dealt with three or four in total across the district of these types of um, of these types of cases. And also internally to us, when we do representation, we have a whole panel of people who vote on how to represent uh, what we think is important to assert in representation, et cetera. But this represents a, a change and it was something um, that we, that I would tell you we gave to the other side because we also felt that there was a lot more that we were going to win from this. Um, Part-time office hours. Oh, go ahead, Linda. Yeah, I have a feeling that the last one might be making people nervous. So I wondered if you could talk more about the written reprimand part of it and the the steps and the concept of progressive discipline, as well as just the fact that um, maybe you could say more about what prompts an investigation and the difference between having been the subject of an investigation versus this consequence arising. I think yes. that might put folks at more, help sure. them understand better what this does and doesn't mean. Sure, so there are four steps to progressive discipline um, that, that are outlined in uh, Article 27. I don't 27, know. that's right. Thank you, I put my contract away. I think that's just subconsciously me being done with negotiations, but Article 27, and there's four different steps. Um, first would be uh, an oral reprimand, there's an oral reprimand, um, then there's what we call a letter of counseling. And then the written reprimand is the, the third level. Um, anytime there's a, when we talk about um, this type of misconduct investigation, this can be something that's like a hostile workplace environment, um, disciplinary action. It could be a disciplinary action related to uh, sexual harassment. Um, it could also stem from how someone may have mistreated a student in a classroom, all of which rise to the level where you have the right to union representation. Um, Michael or Linda, did you want, did I need to add anything else in there? Uh, no, I, I don't think so, except to say that um, we, you know, that we can represent you at every stage of this process. Uh, the, um, and the the pilot part of it, as Belinda said, and I just want to re-emphasize this, uh, we can look at it at the end of each individual year. It's a pilot for the full year, three-year contract cycle, but we can look at it at the end of each individual year and uh, decide to end it because what we were, the, the thing we were concerned about here is not the mechanism itself really, but the sense that some deans may take it, take an opportunity to use it just to get rid of someone they didn't like for some reason. And we wanted to make sure that didn't happen. Um, and Belinda said, and I think this is right, that this was a give for us, but I think it was also in some ways a reflection of the values of the part-time faculty is that, we, you know, um, we have, uh, I think the, the faculty themselves appreciate that it's uh, reasonable to remove preference from people who are not acting in a way that's sort of consistent with the the values uh, that we're supposed to be upholding as faculty. I, I don't think that will happen very often at all. I'm hoping this measure will never be used. Uh, but if it is, we have a if it is used, then it will be used appropriately. And if it's not, then we have a mechanism to get rid of it. That that was the idea behind this. Great. Um, did I see Ornate's hand up? Yeah, she just put it down. Um, okay. Arnett, are you there? Yeah, I think I had my hand up a little bit. I I would say, you know, please feel free to reach out to your campus union president because sometimes you worry a lot and you, you know, you don't realize that, you know, some contract information can just ease you up. And uh, sorry, I put in the wrong, I put the inf contract information in the chat, but only to one person. Anyway, thank you. Great. We can all go back to all of this stuff later. So I'm just going to go through all the changes. Linda, did you want to add in? Oh, oh I was just going to add one more thing, which is that this may have been made sufficiently clear, but for anybody who's unaware of these investigation processes that sometimes happen, they can be triggered by a complaint by a student. And it can end up taking a fair amount of resources um, to, to attend meetings and you know, represent your side of the story, what happened, what the student says. But in my experience, the vast majority of time, um, the investigations do not, don't 
end in discipline, let alone the highest level of discipline. So um, yeah, I just wanted to add my voice that we, we were very, very careful about this and making sure there were all kinds of safeguards and guardrails, et cetera. So thanks. Great. Also, Belinda, before you move on, uh -huh. um, can you explain a bit more about second preference? Uh, can I defer that one over to Linda because she does a better job of it for me, the second level preference, the 0.6 preference? Linda, are you? Um, sure, if folks want to hear about it now. Um, yeah, yeah, I think Michael and I had both said in the chat, oh, let's let's wait until after. But yeah, so our we have our preference system is, that's what we call our rehire right system. We have um, essentially two levels of preference for part-time faculty. The first is earned once you've completed eight out of the previous 12 semesters, meaning the soonest you could earn that right, that rehire right is four years, eight, semest eight um, sub um, consecutive semesters. But that eight out of 12 means that there are four semesters of play where if you didn't have an assignment, you chose not to have an assignment, um, you'd still be making progress toward earning that rehire right. And then the higher level is, um, that works the same way, but it's 16 out of 20 semesters. Um, so you can do the math, that would be a minimum of eight years. And the concept of a rehire right is, even though we are, maybe this is more detail than anyone needs, but I, I presume that there are folks here who are kind of new to this. So. The concept is that even though we are considered temporary according to education code, which is state law, um, it's just it's it's um, a moral crime to treat people as perm attempts to the degree that it was possible to do before the state instituted a rehire rights requirement. Los Rios already had a rehire rights um, requirement or system rather, not requirement, but a system in place long before the state um, mandated this. But essentially it means that there has to be the state determined in 2016, went through the legislature and the governor signed it, that every community college needs to bargain in good faith with the sole representative of part-time faculty, which is a union, in order to arrive at some fair and consistent system whereby people can earn the right to be offered classes semester after semester, assuming that there's work available before anyone who hasn't yet earned that right is offered anything. Um, so it's supposed to work against, you know, people who've served for a long time, just suddenly having no job for really no good reason. Um, the 0.6 preference part is something that got negotiated not quite 10 years ago, more recently than that, but it was a, it's a special provision whereby, um, part-time faculty can earn a right to um, be offered more than the 0.4 or 40% of a full-time load, which is what our contract is currently capped at for most part-timers. The provision says that if you have been scheduled at 0.595 or higher, effectively 0.6 for five out of the previous six semesters, then you've earned the right to be offered 0.6. So this was, this is something that, I mean, it seems it's, we're not happy that, that it's limited in this way. We would have very much liked to see um, it possible for people to earn a point, a right to 0.6 um, offer, which is very close to the state limit of what we can work as part-time faculty in a given district in any given um, year. Um, but the district was not, not very um, cooperative on that. So I hope that I explain that carefully enough. If it's if you're new to it, it might be kind of technical. And a couple of things I want to note. Uh, one is that they put the language into the chat, but also this summer, uh, Linda and Lakeisha are going to be working on updating our part-timer almanac, which I think, uh, which will again roll out in the fall as another way to kind of um, talk about these uh, rehire rights. And it is specific to the campus you're at. So you could hold, potentially hold preference at more than one uh, campus, but you earn preference at the at, at each individual campus. It's not across the district. Um, we can come back to some of this towards the end. So let's go ahead to go to office hours. Um, we, uh, one of the things that um, we also considered a, nice, a, a, a win for us is um, office hours will be paid at class and step on the B2 schedule. 
We do have the ultimate goal of getting that over to the B1 schedule, um, but this moves it away from, um, what was it? It was B2, or it was B3 step one, class one, I think is what it was being paid at. Might've been a little higher than that. I apologize. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, uh, but the officers will be paid a class step on, your, on the B2 schedule. Um, adjunct uh, faculty are permitted to hold all their office hours online. This was already uh, a, one of your rights. We actually just literally moved language that was existent in the part-time office hour form into the contract. Um, for whatever reason, the last time through, the, the language didn't translate over from the form into the contract. So uh, the changes that you'll see um, are, are basically were already existing rights. The one thing that is important to note that for all faculty, uh, all, you know, all, um, all classroom faculty, is that online office hours must be provided in the syllabus. It might be time and day specific, uh, but you, have, you must offer students opportunity to use a video conferencing system such as Zoom but you can also offer other communication formats. So hypothetically, I know that um, I have colleagues that use Discord. Um, what they will do on their syllabus would list both the Discord channel, um, but also have a Zoom link available that they could click onto in the case that the student wants to um, talk to you face-to-face, -face. but you should have a Zoom link available um, uh, at all times. So, but online, but if you're doing online office hours, you must have, a Zoom, offer, a Zoom format, and also, and you can also offer other communication formats. Um, it is one of the conditions now for all online office hours for all uh, for all faculty. Linda. Yeah, just to clarify and make sure that my understanding of what we agreed to here is accurate, I think it is that um, this doesn't mean that during an online office hour you necessarily have to have like Zoom open with you on video, just waiting for someone to pop in. It means that if a student contacts you through another means and says, hey, um, I would really love to hop on a, on a video with you, that you should be able to pivot to that. And they'll already know what link to use. It's just a matter of you opening up your Zoom. And this was a concern because some, some folks on the negotiations team were saying, really, we have to be like, monitoring all these different channels simultaneously? And the answer is no, you really don't. You could have one means of communicating with students whereby they tell you, do you want, if they want a video meeting and then boom, that's what you pivot to. Right, it, correct. Is that accurate? Okay. Yes, and that your dean, if, if for some reason they're, uh, they need to track you down, down in a time and date specific, that they should be able to go either to your Discord channel or whatever you're using for your online office hour to be able to reach you. Um, and so that was the other interest that they wanted met. So, you know, um, if you know that you're going to be on Discord in real time, just like I said, have that listed as your primary. And you just know that you're, if not the deans pop into office hours all the time, but this was something that came up in negotiations. The time and day specific part is really important. The other thing that's important to note that's been deleted from the old online office hours is email. Email is no longer an option for how you do your online office hours. So. As adjunct faculty, just you know, or actually any faculty member also has the right to do all of their office hours um, on ground if they if they choose to. But again, um, there is the flexibility of online. You just have to have that Zoom piece available. Um, but we do want to make sure, right, that you um, that you must have a Zoom video conferencing link available, so that if students, for example, uh, I guess the example I would use is for some of my colleagues in math. Right? If someone is having trouble with a particular math equation and needs to be able to see in real time how to do it, they would be able to get you face to face in a Zoom conference to be able to do it. Um, I think in the business, they were given an example in economics of doing a pivot table of needing to be able to show the students um, in real time how to do it because it doesn't always work in email or on the phone. Um, remote work. <clears throat> I think it's important to note that. Um, for all different areas, we have uh, the definition of remote. Remote work refers to faculty members performing their professional responsibilities as listed in Article 8 of the CBA in a location other than campus, their campus assignment or any other Los Rios facility. Online refers to the modality in which faculty provide instruction, services, or resources to the students. And eligibility is not a guarantee of any kind of remote assignment. It's an up to amount and no amount of remote assignment is guaranteed in a given semester. 
This particular delineation of remote and online is especially important for those of you in the student services, because the contention is, is that they could assign you to be on ground in the office at counseling, for example, and you can be taken, you can be taken online um, appointments. The, for those of us on the classroom side, online and remote is the same thing. Um, they're, they're synonymous. So I just really want to make um, that very clear. Classroom and instructional faculty, um, tenure, tenure track, long-term temporary and adjunct faculty are all eligible to teach up to 100% of their load remotely online. Um, this is, this is uh, again, the eligibility. It doesn't mean that you are entitled to it and, you're, and the dean may opt um, to not give you an online class or an online modality. And um, uh, like I said, that this may vary from semester to semester. So for example, for a part-timer like Linda, because uh, I know she loves online so much, uh, she, will, she can teach all three of her classes in the online, moda online modality. Um, or her, she may, you know, she may want, she may want all three of her classes online, but her dean says, well, Linda, we really, we really love having you on the ground. So guess what? Um, you're going to teach two of your three classes on the ground at Consumers River College. It is entirely the dean's right of assignment. Now for counselors, um, tenure, tenure track, long-term temp, and adjunct uh, Counseling faculty are eligible to receive up to 0.4 of remote assignment in any given scheduling period. The scheduling period, which is important to note, is done in half yearly chunks. So uh, if for those of you who don't know counseling, counseling is basically the full timers are divided onto a, a fiscal year calendar, 174 days for, that goes from July 1 um, to June 30th. Schedule period number one is July 1 to December, to December 31st. And then scheduling period two is January 1st to June 30th. And they will be decided remote um, assignment twice a year. Um, all counselors who are eligible, uh, who are currently enrolled in or have completed the online counselor training, CBC OEI online uh, college counselor course, which is the 40 hour course, are eligible for up to 0.6 FTE. It just increases your eligibility. We will be sending now when we when I send out all of the um, I'm going to send out links to a lot of the different uh, pieces here. Um, I'm also going to make sure that we forward the link to this particular class. We want to note that through this, at least through the summer, but we're also hoping all the way through December, you can be paid to take that class, that 40 hour class that was already pre negotiated with the higher education relief funds. Um, I also want to note that with counselors, if you go and read the summary document, which I believe Michael's been putting into the chat, or if not, he can do it right now, there are a lot of restrictions related to how you do your work. Um, this is representative of some of the, um, at times, contentious negotiations that occurred, um, but you must be camera on. Um, that also is important to note for counselors is that they, there's a fear that they won't have enough people on ground for on ground counseling services. Um, and so it should be noted that if they realize that they are short people who to do on ground services and they're, they're going to do a call out to all the full timers first to see if anybody will change their day. But in the event that someone's remote day can't be changed there, they will ask starting with the non preferenced uh, adjuncts if they would swap their on, their on ground, uh, sorry, their, their remote day. Um, and so that is one part uh, to take note of in the council remote work piece. Remote work for coordinators, librarians, and nurses um, for all categories are at basically for up to 0.6 FTE of remote assignment. Um, the 0.8 is actually only for, for, full for, for full timers there in any scheduling period with the approval of the area dean. A couple of things I wanna note about the category of coordinators, librarians, and nurses. There are only four college nurses district wide, and almost all of and all of them actually have responsibilities related to the running of the campus clinics. So, because of their job description, they are less likely to have remote remote work eligibility than, for example, someone who might be doing coordination related to distance education. Coordinators is also a big job title that includes a ton of different people. Um, we call our coaches athletic coordinators, 
for example, and because of their job assignment, again, may not have a lot of online assignments. But we also have folks like the Puente and Emoja coordinators, where they'll be on a counseling schedule and it may depend on the split between coordinating duties and their counseling duties. So just know that coordinator group tends to be um, a huge bucket of lots of different um, job titles. And that in this particular category, your remote work assignment will largely be determined um, by job description and then how much they need you on ground. Any questions about the remote work pieces here? Looks like we're okay. I'm just going to encourage folks as you read through the sort of areas on the contract changes there, so feel free to just email any of us or email me with questions um, related to the job title because it's going to be look a little different for folks, for each different group of folks. So performance review, this is something that I also consider a big win because I know that part-time faculty have been asking for this for quite a while. We heard it loud and clear in the forums um, that the encounters with bias or having to be reviewed by someone you feel that you may have had a, um, a less than collegial relationship with. Um, adjunct faculty undergoing performance review will be allowed a peremptory challenge to remove a member of the review team. It will work exactly how it does with the full-timers. Uh, with basically by the end of week two, you would indicate to the Senate president on your campus that per the contract, you would like to remove Belinda Lum from your committee. You don't have to give a reason. And the Senate president has the right to replace that person. So that's the other thing to note is that the Senate president in consultation with the chair and dean will work to replace uh, the individual. You're not gonna have a choice as to who that person is. But you can. But we, we have allowed for somebody to be removed from your committee. It cannot happen during your very first review, which tends to be the compliance review for ed code, but can be done every cycle if needed. And we, we really hope you don't need it every cycle, but just know that the peremptory challenge is there. The equity reflection pilot language is also removed from all areas of the contract. Basically what this means is that all faculty will still complete the reflection, but the reflection itself is not used as part of the evaluation process. It's handed in at the same time and is meant to be used as a conversation piece, but it cannot be used as an evidence as evidence of a less than satisfactory review. Is there anything in the chat that I need to respond to? I'm just seeing that I just get to can see the numbers going up, so I can't tell if there's anything to respond to. Yeah, there's it's just uh, we're trying to clarify what it means to be to have a peremptory challenge against one member of the team since part time faculty only have two members on the team, one of whom is the dean, and we're not allowed to remove the dean. Correct. We effectively now can change our team, <laughs> which is a pretty significant. We've we've wanted this for a long time and finally we were able we were able to get it yes so student reviews another part of performance review process is also going to default to online reviews for all classes if you're teaching on ground what's delivered online will be the uh, exact uh it'll be a replica of the online review uh, but it will be done in the digital format and delivered via canvas um, faculty teaching on ground or hybrid courses may elect to have on ground student reviews. If you, if you opt for an on ground review, you must inform the dean by the end of the second week of the semester. This will be included in all of the pre review meetings um, or pre review communications. So you would need to communicate this right away. Um, this is stuff that we'll you know, talk about um, as we do some of our contract education at the beginning of the semester. But we know that in certain areas, it may be advantageous to have an on-ground review and it's incredibly important. So we retained that as a possibility, but the default is online reviews. Um, online student reviews will occur week six of the semester for eight week one classes, week 12 of the semester for 16 week classes, week four of the eight week two classes. And in the 16 week classes, you have the ability to move the week if needed. Any questions about student reviews? Looks like we're okay. Can I just say, Belinda, it's just worth sort of at the beginning of the semester, 
just keep in mind the timeline Belinda mentioned there. If you do want on-ground reviews, then you'll need to uh, notify the dean by the end of the second week. Um, and uh, because the timeline gets pretty tight after that. And I know the first couple of weeks of the semester are, are quite hectic as you're sort of uh, ramping up your classes. So just keep that in mind if you're someone who would prefer your student re reviews to be in the classroom. Great. So Article 11, professional expectations. Um, one thing that's important to note, we were already mandated to use the LMS, which is the learning management system, which is currently Canvas. For those of you who've been around for the last five years or been here for five years or longer, you know, uh, we switched over to Canvas about five years ago from Blackboard, but currently you must use the Canvas learning management system. Um, and the one major change is, you, uh, you, is that you must use the LMS gradebook consistent with the grading procedure outlined in your syllabus. So here I wanna um, talk a little bit about this. We were deliberately vague in, in how we constructed this. We know that about 80% of our faculty already use the, the gradebook. And so this may actually not mean a huge procedural change for them. But when we talk about using it consistent with your syllabus, some folks do what we call ungrading. Um, and so it may be that at the very end, you put in their final grade or you just have everything listed as 100 and you bring it down as you go. Um, but the word use doesn't necessarily imply a particular temporal of like when you're using it, but at the, at the very least, your final grades should be in that grade book that's on the LMS. Um, Michael or Linda or Keisha, did you want any add anything else there? Am I forgetting anything? I can't think of anything. Linda's got a hand up. What, Linda? I just want to emphasize what you just said, that it's up to you to determine what use looks like. No one's going to be policing your grade book or being like, mm, you know, that is that is not supposed to happen. Um, so, but put yeah. it in your syllabus. Whatever you decide to do, have it in your syllabus. So, Article Nine. Hang on, with, um, sorry, hang on. There's, there's Leon's got his hand up, uh, Belinda. Go ahead, Leon. Yeah, and it only has to be consistent if you're penalizing students, if you're helping them out, then they don't really, the students aren't gonna complain if you're inconsistent. <laughs> True. That's probably right. <laughs> Sadly. It's life, right? <laughs> so article nine, we've made actually quite a bit of wins here. Um, number one, we've re redefined immediate family um, to, and it's a much larger inclusive group. But one thing I do wanna note is that if you go to the summary document, you'll see that per California state law, we can now designate a person, right? Who we consider to be family member. And it's designated at the time in which you take the leave. So for some of us, we have our family by blood and, and we also have people we consider, um, you know, our family by choice. And so under California state law is now allowed and in the, in the uh, expansion of the definition of immediate family um, reflects that. And I think that's something that's important to note for everybody here. We also redefine sick leave to include mental health, mental illness, as well as physical illness of the employee. Um, in particular, the mental health component of this was important for us. We, uh, we know that the Black Staff and Faculty Association in particular had this in their list of demands in 2020 and then 2022. Um, to be able to acknowledge right, that, they're, that in general, caring for our mental health is important, but especially in cases where you are the uh, subject of discriminatory action, victim of that. And so for us, um, in acknowledgement of that and also acknowledging like all the changes that we've all had to uh, endure during the pandemic and how difficult it's been coming back, we advocated for that as well. And so now mental health and mental illness can be part of the reason in which you use your sick leave. There is an expanded parental leave. This is a pilot, um, an employee, this is full and part-timers will be granted eight consecutive weeks of paid parental leave. A week means seven consecutive 24 hour periods. The leave is not deducted from any other leave category and is limited to one use per fiscal year. Um, I also want to note that this number does not change if you have twins or triplets, um, but it's an eight week uh, piece here. Um, and then you can, after that, you can use up to 12 weeks of accumulated sick leave for parental leave. And this runs concurrently with the California Family Rights Act. And that this is attached to your existing 
existing sick leave. So essentially the goal for the group was to be able to piece together a way in which someone could have a semester off to be with their child. Um, um, so the reason it's a pilot is that we absolutely, there with this and the other leaves, we actually have to be careful to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible with this and see how this runs as we move forward. Um, Orni. Yeah, thank you, Belinda. So um, I would also like to add that uh, if you're a full-time faculty member and you have you save up type C leave, you can use partial type C leave to supplement this if you want a longer leave. Thank you. It's in the contract. Okay. Um, we also have a pilot for critical illness leaves. Oh, sorry, Linda, did you need to? Okay. Um, critical illness leaves, which is also a pilot, all regular adjunct and overload faculty shall be granted seven work days per year of salary entitlement, entitlement in the case of critical illness or accident of a member of the immediate family. Um, so seven work days is based off of your schedule. Um, when we talked about the week, it was concurrent days. Work days is based off of your schedule. So depending on how you're scheduled, this could end up being, uh, you know, one and a half weeks worth of days off, or it could also, if you're only working two days a week, end up being, you know, three and a half to four. Mm -hmm. So just know that in advance. Um, this is also a pilot. Again, we, with all of the leaves pieces, these are all new. And so we don't really have a baseline for understanding the fiscal impact. And we are going to be incredibly careful about making sure we monitor this to make sure that, uh, that we've put enough protections in there so that we can maintain, uh, maintain the leaves for as many people as possible for as long as possible. Um, Michael. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to reinforce that and connect it back to the point that Belinda was making at the beginning about the so-called bucket system. Um, no one should be um, uh, like we, no one should be too uh, sort of uh, don't think that it's these leaves are the district just handing us these leaves. The pay the, the money for these leaves actually effectively comes out of uh, the faculty bucket here. Um, and so this is in some ways the, uh, us sort of allocating some of our own money to pay people. The, there were efforts in the leaves team to ask the district to share the cost of these leaves, but the district was not interested in doing that. And that's why we have to be a little bit careful financially in how these leaves get used because um, they, they come out of our bucket and uh, the use of that money impacts everybody. Um, and then we also have bereavement leave, which eliminates the pilot language and makes permanent the salary and time for bere bereavement leave. What basically this means is that if you live uh, within 250 miles of the district office, you're entitled to three days of bereavement leave. If it's over 250 miles from the district office, uh, it is five days, or sorry, it's 300 miles, not 250, it's 300 miles. So within 300 miles, it's uh, three days. Outside of the 300 miles, it is five days. Um, originally, it used to be northern, they used to have a designation of in-state and out-of-state, but then we pointed out that it's farther to get to Los Angeles than it is to get to Reno, um, and so that's how we switched to that last time. So, um, I do know that folks may have heard, right, that um, we do also have a, uh, we revamped the catastrophic leave program. Um, that particular piece of it is not, uh, part-time faculty are not eligible for the catastrophic leave uh, program. Um, again, there was a number of different elements that went into this. It's not that we didn't ask, but also we had to make some decisions based off of the different fiscal realities that were uh, in front of us. Um, and so one of the things that we felt that we, when we looked at our overarching financial priorities, we looked at the survey that was done um, of all of our faculty, it was pretty clear that in terms of resources, um, clearly that we wanted to make sure that we got uh, paid, uh, you know, increase the office hour pay, uh, getting closer to step in class, um, developing a more expansive professional development and um, service component for part-timers that was also at step in class. And, it, you know, within leaves, trying to give as many salary entitlements as possible to uh, part-timers. The catastrophic leave, I would, I would like to note, is an application process. You'd have to, uh, under the current language, you'd have to exhaust all of your sick leave. And so for us, putting money towards things like critical illness seems like um, an, an important piece for us. But 
Uh, again, as we noted earlier with any of our financial decisions, if we go over budget, it comes out of everybody's salaries um, in the end. Um, Orni, did you have your hand up? Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. You know, I, I'm not sure if um, Jason's here, but I believe actually on the cut leave, the district said they were not interested, period. Thank you. Okay. Any questions on the leaves I need to answer at this point? Walter put a question in the chat, if you could. Um, he wrote, define immediate family, please, before legal dependents were immediate family at CSU, but only biological children at Los Rios, which um, I don't think it was restricted to biological, uh, included adopt, adopted children if you were their, their like, I think. Anyway, I'll leave it to you. Michael, if you're able to cut and paste that over yeah. from our document, that'd be Ad helpful. Actually, cutting and pasting is a bit of a pain because there's a whole bunch of uh, strikeout language in there, and I would have to identify every every single thing. But it basically, immediate family is parent, grandparent, or grandchild of the employee or the employee's spouse or domestic partner. Um, spouse, domestic partner, child, son-in-law, stepchild, daughter-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, aunt, uncle, child or sibling of domestic partner or spouse of domestic partner's child. I know that's quite a lot um, to uh, to absorb all in one go, um, but it's basically sort of everyone sort of out to the level of cousin or children-in-law uh, or aunt or uncle at your, for you and for a domestic partner or um, uh, or spouse. May, may I add, so Walter, so basically, I know your situation. Every year, every 12 months, you can vaccinate one person. Uh, it can be anyone. So so uh, that's the piece that uh, is really nice because there's a piece of legislation on this. And what the district decided to do was to use the ad code instead, but it is uh, a piece of legislation. And Michael put the ad code code in the chat. And so because the expanded definition of immediate family, you can designate, you know, the river or, or um, Jordan as your immediate family in a 12 month period. Uh, sorry to much in Michael, but I, I thought because uh, I know my, uh, Walter, oh, I think true. that is very important to him. Yep. So that would resolve your issue. Um. Federation rights, we uh, increase the reassigned time provided by the district to the union for the purpose of representation uh, to 3.5 FD annually to 4.0 FD annually. This, this helps us with our representational duties that we do at the local and district level. Um, we have a number of MOUs because we weren't able to get all the work done in, in, the, in the 10 to 11 weeks that we were in it. Um, of, of particular importance to this group, is that uh, we have been trying to work to get adjunct faculty paychecks um, paid equally across the five months. Um, and on the first day of the month, there is an MOU that, they, that we've signed to, uh, what's the word, assess, investigate the, the ability to- Evaluate, to I think is evaluate. the term we used. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> evaluate if that's possible. Um, and hopefully we will have some conclusion by December of this year. Was that, that was the December of this year? Right, they're supposed to provide the union with a report by the end of December explaining what logistical or other hurdles there might be, whether they're going to be able to do this, and if they can, when they would be able to implement it. Yeah. The other thing I want to note, um, this is actually attached to something very major that we want before we entered into, into contract negotiations. Uh, one of the big wins, and, and I uh, want to say that Linda Sneed was really at the heart of a lot of this work at a statewide level, um, is that at the state, we there was $200 million, $200 million ongoing dedicated to part-time health benefits. So that if you were working a 0.4 assignment um, or more, you would have the equivalent of full-time benefits. In November, November, December, uh, Los, uh, LRCFT signed an MOU with the district to implement those, um, uh, those health benefits so that every faculty member uh, who's eligible for health care in Los Rios um, can pay the same as full-timers for, uh, uh, for health benefits, um, 
provide their eligible. So right now the eligibility is basically you have to work with for us for a year. Um, or it's and then if, if you if let's say you had a off semester, is it two out of the last five, Linda, or three out of the last five? Um, for eligibility, yeah, yes. two out of the previous five. Two out of the previous five. Um, to be eligible for healthcare and they have an so it's essential a minimum of a year waiting period, which yeah. And also having an assignment of 0.3 or above. So if you're at 0.4, you get full time health benefits. If you're at a 0.3, you get subsidized benefits. We basically take care of about 75% of the cost. Um, but our ultimate goal, right, is to really want to have, to have our, just like with full time faculty, being eligible from the moment in which you're hired for health benefits. Um, which would mean if you're on Sutter, like I am, you would pay about $67.50 a month. If you're at Kaiser, I believe it's like 340 a month. Um, and we have high deductible plans and, and uh, I'm forgetting the other one that you don't pay anything for, but there's another one in there anyway. So sorry, you hear it. Um, but basically for us, we, the big push now is to make sure that we have immediate healthcare eligibility for our faculty. Um, we also should note that a big part of, of what we signed in was also the multi-district reimbursement program. Uh, where we will pay for our fair share or our proportionate share of uh, adjuncts uh, benefits if they have a 0.4 combined with us in another district. Now that being said, um, now that being said, it's important to note that uh, a lot of districts are still negotiating. And so while we have the multi-district plans, not everyone does, but hypothetically, if you work with us and maybe Peralta or some of the places in the Bay Area, you might be able to combine to get fully reimbursed. Thank you, it was Western Health Advantage. Thanks, Michelle. Um, also, uh, we, we know with athletic coach stipends, there's a lot of work that happens um, post uh, the end of the semester in terms of coaching. So we're gonna evaluate and investigate that as well as the distribution of different stipends there. Um, a piece that does impact part-timers is lab lecture parity. Uh, we will have to work with our Senate partners on this to look at um, all of the different things that we have labeled as lab which is a big, huge group of things, sort of like the category of coordinator that I discussed earlier, and look at it relative to workload, et cetera. Um, and also put in for us, it's important, a fiscal plan to try to work towards uh, building towards that lab lecture uh, parity. Um, I'm gonna skip over the offside for full-time counselors working overload because it's not relevant here, um, but the prison education program, which has a, is being taught by about 75% adjuncts, um, there are a lot of different provisions in there that give stipends for going out to the different work sites, for the training involved, et cetera. We did not have time to fully evaluate the program and intend to go back into, uh, to revisit that MOU um, in the fall. Uh, so we've extended the, the existing MOU for a year to make sure that people still get the stipends that they are entitled to relative to working in that program. So that's what I have in terms of this slide deck, but I know there might be different questions. I'm happy to answer as our members of the team. Um, and I was gonna say, I'll leave the recording on for now unless, um, unless folks uh, have questions that they would prefer to ask without being recorded. Are there any general questions? Go ahead, Linda. I, I, folks may feel confident they know the answer to this, but I just wanted to clarify in terms of the immediate family um, definition, um, has there ever been, has the district ever required documentation of someone's familial status for, we're not talking about health insurance benefits, but rather for um, because, for example, if I don't know whether you were able to catch this or if you've ever noticed it, but in spite of our efforts, the definition of immediate family still, with the caveat that yes, there is that designated person, it still inexplicably excludes cousins <laughs> as it lays out these like kinship categories. Um, so my question is really to, um, well, it's a broad question that could apply to all those categories, but with respect to the designated person, I'm presuming that 
we should not expect a demand to provide any kind of documentation about who this person is. It's just literally a name and, um, or does it even have to be a name? Can you, what will they require? I'm gonna to defer to Ornate or Jason since they were yeah. on that in those conversations. Thank you, Belinda. So um, I, I can send you the legislation, Linda. So basically you have, there's a form you have to fill out every 12 months, you send out the name if you need someone. If you need someone, it, not every 12 months, when you need to designate someone according to the legislation as your designated immediate family member for that year, when you need, for example, okay, you are sick. I'm sorry, not you. Okay, John is sick. And I want to use John, I designate John as my immediate family. I would send out the form and say, John is going to be my designated family member uh, for the 12 month period for this period and uh, what this year. And so I don't have to say, basically the, this, the legislation allows that anyone you want to designate is fine. So it can be your cousin. It can be your, you know, your friend next door, but you can do that once a year. Uh, one person only. Make sense? I'll, I'll put the legislation number in the chat. Okay, just give me a minute. Jason? We pushed hard to include cousin, but the district pushed back even harder because some of us have literally perhaps 300 cousins in a, in a region that we might live in. So they cited, you know, the extra amount of times you might have to use it. And as far as documentation goes, I've never heard of the district asking for any documentation on on legal or uh, biological relationship. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording in case folks have questions they don't want recorded.